After the revelation of a small nuclear disaster occurring just over a kilometer from their position, Slip and Adam acted quickly. Slip pulled a small rectangular device out of her pocket and placed it on the rooftop after tapping a small button on the side. Adam inferred that this device was the infrared beacon that Grimm had ordered her to place. With Slip shifting to cover the doorway, Adam turned his focus to the direction they had retreated from previously. He watched the inferno that lit up the night sky, along with the trickle of people driving and walking down the roadway, clearly fleeing the impending radiological disaster. More than likely, the average layman didn't yet know that the inferno was pumping near Chernobyl levels of radiation from into the atmosphere, but an explosion and an ensuing inferno in the tinderbox that was the windy and dry land that encompassed Cheyenne was enough to cause most people to want to make themselves scarce. After several minutes of this, the radio crackled to life. Team 1, I have your beacon. Clear LZ, said the pilot, as a shuttle dropped into view from the smoke cloud. LZ is clear, pilot, said Slip. Get us out of here. With that, the shuttle touched down, and Slip moved to open the door. Adam entered the cab, followed closely by her, closing the door as she sat down across from him. Adam's stomach lurched slightly as the pilot took off, assumedly in the direction of Team 2. The shuttle flew for several minutes, giving Adam time to ponder just what was going on. If the Rebels had access to nuclear material, things were going to get a lot worse around Earth. Many in the past had stood poised to turn the world into an irradiated hellscape with a push of a button, and they were charged with being responsible for the defense of their entire nation. What Rebels could do with thermonuclear devices in their endless ideological war against the Shill, Adam really didn't want to think about. Thankfully, he didn't have to, as the radio crackled to life with a panic sounding grim. Shuttle, this is Pod 7 Actual. Be advised, LZ is hot. The audible crackle of human rifle fire and Shulbanti laser rifle fire coming over the radio audibly as the transmission proceeded. Recommend you hover until this gets sorted out. Over. Received Actual. Maintain your holding pattern until you give the green light, the pilot responded. This gave Adam an idea. While he had never personally used a sniper rifle from a helicopter before, he knew many men who had. When he felt the gravity shift slightly, he knew the pilot was entering a banked holding pattern above the team's location. He slid open the door to the icy, now irradiated abyss, and grabbed a small hooked core that hung the left side of the sliding door, and affixed it to a loop on the other. Clearly, someone had used the craft for his idea before. Resting his rifle on the core between the bipod and the small vertical foregrip, he looked down the sights of the city below. He saw a white van pulled off to the side of the road, with two thermally illuminated figures clearly taking cover behind it. Another stood in an alley to the right-hand side, with the fourth on the other side of the roadway behind a parked car. Assuming this was his team, he scanned for more targets. About 80 meters in front of them were 10 men, split evenly between two rooftops on either side of the roadway. Muzzle flashes illuminated by the scope's combination thermal and night vision. Estimating the distance to be about 400 meters from where they were circling, he lined up his first shot and pulled the trigger. Missing about a meter to the right of his target, he realized that he forgot to factor in the fact that the shutter was moving as he fired. He adjusted his aim, and this time took the target's arm off for the shoulder. The man dropped, clutching the stump that was once a fully functional limb. His teammates were going to look around in shock, clearly searching for the sniper. Adam noticed one of the men's head pop like a watermelon, as he was clearly hit by his teammates below. Moving to his next target, he went for the man at the corner of the building, clearly operating a machine gun of some kind. This round took him square in the chest, either penetrating his plate carrier outright, or folding it into his chest, breaking ribs. He dropped and instinctively clutched at the new hole that had appeared in his armour. Adam took this as an opportunity to put two rounds into his pelvic girdle and moved to the last two individuals on the roof. One was clearly laying down covering fire, while the other was desperately trying to fix his friend's mangled stump. Adam took aim at the one laying fire, pulling his first shot too far to the left, crashing into an electric panel in a shower of sparks. Cursing under his breath, Adam lined up the next round and fired. This one hit his mark, if higher than he intended. The target fell to the ground, clutching at his now mangled jaw, only for Adam to send a round into his unarmored chest before moving on to the medic, who had moved on to the down machine gunner. Adam sent four rounds in quick succession, taking the man in the chest once, missing twice, and the fourth round severing his leg below the knee. Satisfied with his work in the left building, Adam shifted his aim to the one on the right, which had now become the left as their holding pattern took them around the location. Clearly, they had seen what happened to their compatriots, and were splitting their attention between the commandos on the ground and the hovering aircraft. Adam had already downed his first man when they located him, one man indicating for their own machine gunner to fire at the craft. As traces from the machine gun streaked towards the craft, Adam worked to line up his shot. From this side, he had to compensate in the opposite direction from what he had done to the first team. He fired, missing a foot to the left of the machine gunner when the rounds first connected with the craft. 
They pinged off the outside armor harmlessly, but one round cracked uncomfortably close to Adam's head. He was about to take a shot when the machine gunner fell back, clutching a new hole in his left shoulder. Adam realized someone down below had neutralized the man when he moved to fire at a man who was clearly gesturing and giving orders. Sending two rounds one after the other, he stitched the commander in the groin and upper chest. The man fell, twitching noticeably. Two men were left on the roof when four silhouettes broke from the building in a last ditch effort to engage the shield from close quarters. After one of the assaulting men was cut down in short order by laser fire from Team 2, Adam figured they had the situation well in hand. Moving back to the men on the roof, he noticed that one of the targets on the roof was clearly giving aid to the down machine gunner, while the other was shooting at the commanders below with a very recognisable weapon. The M82.50 caliber sniper rifle was a beast to handle, with an arrowhead shaped break on the front of the weapon that took the recoil down from shoulder shattering to bone rattling. It was one of the few weapons that could be reliably trusted with the right ammunition to penetrate Shulvati armor regularly. Realising the threat for what it was, Adam fired at the man boarding the anti-material rifle. He put it round to the left of the man's head, with the second taking him nearly dead centre in the chest. With his heart probably pulverised from the impact, he dropped the rifle, fell back, and started violently twitching while pouring at his chest uselessly. The medic clearly seen the situation as hopeless, and returned to firing down on the shield troopers, and before Adam could take a shot, he had fallen back, clutching two holes in his chest. Believing the roof to be clear, he moved his sights to the men who were sallied forth from the buildings below. Three were downed, but the fourth had pushed the commando behind the car, too close for comfort for Adam to take a shot. He watched with the scope as the commando rounded the car from the other side, battling his weapon away, drawing her pistol, and unloading no less than seven shots from point blank range into his chest, neck and face. The now charred and smoking corpse fell away, with the commando holstering the pistol, and returning to her rifle to scan the surrounding area. Seeming to be satisfied that the situation was pacified, the soldier put a hand to the side of her helmet. Pods have an actual to shuttle. Damn fine shooting up there, Needle. Uh, Adam? LZ is clear. Get us the fuck out of here. Acknowledged, actual. The pilot replied, banking the shuttle down towards the other two-thirds of the team. Upon their arrival, Adam unhooked the cord that had supported his rifle and pushed out onto the ground, followed shortly by Slip. Adam moved towards the left side of the road, and the now-identified Major Grimm. He set up just behind the car that was covered for the Major while she fell back to the shuttle. Head moving on a swivel, he watched the rooftops, roadway, and windows for frets. He saw none, and just before he decided to pull back to the shuttle, he noticed the patch on the down rebel's arm. It was a simple thing, and easily recognisable. It had a dagger piercing a skull with a crown sat angled on top. Adam knew it well enough. He had designed it, after all. It was the patch designed for the United States First Resistance Special Operations Battalion, which had been organised by himself and his old friend, Alec Carver, from the shattered remains of the 75th Ranger Regiment, MARSOC, Delta Force, and any other competent fighters they could get their hands on. As he returned to the shuttle, his stomach rolled at the thought that he had been facing men associated with his old Alamater. Even though he had left on less than good terms, it still pained him somewhat to be forced into the realisation that he had fully switched sides. He wasn't neutral, nor even just a collaborator anymore. He was now 100% the enemy he had once made it his life goal to destroy. Climbing into his seat and sliding the door shut behind him, he looked at the faces of his team. Or really, for most of them, their masks. The only exception was Slip, who was staring into the space between herself and his chest, clearly pondering the events of the evening, while Adam did his own thinking. If his old unit was involved in this fight, it would explain how they had gotten their hands on such restricted materials. Alec had always been amazing at leveraging contacts, blackmail and intelligence to make effective gear repair seemingly out of thin air. He had also always been a firebrand compared to Adam. Even while operating at resistance, Adam had always done his best to follow the rules of war. Sure, there were times when no prisoners had been taken, or times where a perm needed some waterboarding to talk, but as a general rule, he avoided such things. Bad PR could be the death of a movement, and he knew this well enough. Alec, on the other hand, seemed to revel in the violence, frequently scalping down Shilvanti when he had the time, along with a no holds barred approach to chemical weaponry. The first time he had seen Alec do something unhinged, it didn't really bother him. The memory of the Shilvanti practically nuking his wife from orbit and labelling it collateral damage was still fresh in his mind at the time. It wasn't until nearly two years ago in Dallas, Texas, that Adam truly began to reconsider his position on Alec. Adam stood on top of a skyscraper, overlooking the city hall of Dallas, Texas. He watched as a combination of Shulvanti and human workers scurried around like ants, setting up the podium, speakers, and other necessary components for the Shulvanti Merrill inauguration speech. His team had been sent here with a simple mission, to infiltrate the newly minted Green Zone around downtown Dallas, and publicly embarrass the perp bitches, while also degrading public confidence to the relative safety that the military forces in the area provided. 
His plan was simple. He'd had Alex sort a few mortar tubes and smuggled them into the city, along with air bursting tear gas rounds. Once the speech started and was broadcast to the surrounding areas, he gassed the crowd and mayor, harmlessly in the long term, but enough to let the populace know that there were still people fighting the good fight. Somewhat unsettlingly, Alec had also procured air bursting mustard gas rounds, suggesting that they use them instead. Adam and Alec had argued for heavenly, with Adam taking the stance that the risk to the surrounding civilian population was too high, and the non-lethal option would effectively communicate to the population that a resistance could still fight the perps, regardless of where they were. Alec had argued that the population inside the green zone had already given up, and had gone full turncoat, no better than the perps themselves. He believed that any sort of collaboration, active or otherwise, meant that in his eyes, they were as viable of a target as the governess herself. Adam hated to pull rank, but did so, bidding Alex to use the tear gas rounds whether he liked it or not. He bitched and moaned, but had left to go carry out the orders given. Adam hadn't spoken to him since, sensing the tension in the air was too thick for him to broach at the moment, and had retired to his observation point. The air up here was only slightly chilly, and to Adam, being from the mountains of Colorado, bordered on warm. He leaned down to the eyepiece of a spotting scope, sat on the tripod, and gazed at the scene unfolding at a car plaza. The scurrying continued on for another hour or so until the stage, podium emblazoned with the governess's seal, and the speakers were all set up. Shortly after this, a crowd began to form, clearly interested in what was happening, or there intentionally from the missive that was sent out earlier in the week en masse with the Green Zone. Following this, a large group of the aliens sauntered forth from the building's entrance towards the stage. Most were clad in the telltale black armour they wore, with a few exceptions. More than likely, they were clerks, recorders, and a local heads of state put in power by the military government. The armour-clad individual set up a perimeter around the stage, with four of the unarmored individuals heading to take a seat off to the side of the podium. One of the perps practically sashayed up to the podium. He was clad in furs atop what appeared to be a poorly imitated Roman legionary's outfit, clearly made of the finest cloth and silks money could buy. Her speech was broadcast around the city, both on video and on the large speakers the shill had set up for public service announcements. People of Earth, she began. The Chauvanti Empire welcomes you to its ranks and noble mission. He tuned her out, her message held no sway over him. He was here purely to observe and officiate the resistance action, before moving on to the next operation that command had for his unit. After about five minutes of the Palmer's speech, he couldn't take any more, and decided now was as good as any. Dagger one actual to all dagger elements, he said over the radio. Green light, I say again, green light. Vague pop sounded from the rooftops of the city, followed by a few seconds of silence. He eagerly anticipated the look on the perp bitches' faces through the spotting scope when they choked and tried to suck air for the thick mucus that filled their faces in response to the tear gas. He watched and heard the vague popping noises of the air burst canisters detonating, barely audible at this distance, and watched the yellow smoke fall on the crowd on stage. The speaker and her unarmored friends began to gag and choke at the irritants, and he felt a sense of pride as he watched the purple bitches collapsing and grasping at their throats before a sudden realization hit him. Tear gas wasn't yellow. But mustard gas was. Panic set in as he watched the armoured bitches try to hurry their dying superiors off stage to no avail. He shifted his gaze to the crowd beyond the podium and his blood ran cold. A sea of bodies rolled and twisted, all in various states of dying in the toxic fumes. Fuck, 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 he thought, as he began to break down the scope and tripod. God fucking damn it, Alec! What did you do?